Hey, this is Matt Markin, and welcome to episode 67 of the Adventures in Advising podcast. The special guest for today's episode is Dr. Ava Lansog from Universidad San Francisco de Quito and Delft University of Technology. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Advising Podcast. Now let's get to episode 67. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. We're at episode 67 and halfway through the month of September. On today's episode, I get to interview Dr. Ava Lansot. Dr. Lansot is a professor of structural engineering at Universidad San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador and a part-time tenured assistant professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Her field of research is the design and analysis of concrete structures and analysis of existing bridges. She has over 130 index publications and serves on various international technical committees and editorial boards in her field. She is also interested in doctoral education and runs the PhD Talk blog and is co-host of the PhD Talk podcast. Ava, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. Yeah, very excited for you to be here. And so let's jump right in. Can you talk about you know, your journey, your path into higher ed and where you're at right now? Sure. So I'm originally from Belgium and I started my studies in Belgium at University of Brussels. And towards the last year of my studies, I got the chance to apply for scholarships to study in the United States. So that took me to Georgia Tech in Atlanta, where I did an additional master's. And at the time, it was the time of the financial crisis of 2008. So it was very hard to find funding and get future prospects. And I had the opportunity to apply for a PhD position in the Netherlands. So that took my journey to the Netherlands. And at my time in at Georgia Tech, I met my husband there, who was from Ecuador. So that's how I ended up living in Ecuador after the PhD. And now I combine my positions at Universidad San Francisco de Quito, which is here in Ecuador, where I'm currently located, with a part-time position at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Very exciting. And it's kind of, you know, one of those things where, um, you know, you're talking about working on like your second master's program. That's also where you, you, you met your now husband. So kind of how things just tie together very nicely. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then you were talking about working at two different uh, universities. Uh, for those that may have heard of Delft University or Universidad San Francisco de Quito, but maybe aren't sure that's all they know is the name. Um, can you talk about and describe um each university that you work at? Sure. So Delft University of Technology is, as the name says itself, a technical university. So it offers only undergraduate and graduate degrees in technical fields. So mostly engineering as well as technical management. It is one of three technical universities in the Netherlands. And the structure in the Netherlands really is that a certain specialization is only thought at one of these three universities. So if you want to study bridges, you go to Delft in the Netherlands. So it has a large laboratory where we can focus on the study of concrete structures, concrete elements. And it is a very international university, I would say. And then Universidad San Francisco de Quito is a small liberal arts college. It is a private university, which is relatively young. I think we are around 30 years of age by now as a university. And it also actually is very international in terms of the professors. And many of them are people who, through family ties, ended up in Ecuador. And it has a lot of international collaborations. And because a university has not just a campus here in Quito, but also a campus in the, or a research station, I should say, in the Amazon, as well as a research station and small campus on the Galapagos Islands. It attracts a lot of international students who come for one or two semesters of uh, interchange. So I think a fifth of university, of, of the students on campus are actually exchange students. So it's it's very international in terms of the exchange students. How is it working you know, at the same time, in a sense, for two, two universities. 
Yeah, that comes, of course, with some practical challenges because <laughs> I cannot just commute one day to one office and the other to the other office. If uh, if I would do that, I, I think I would just only be on a flight uh, because it's, um, it's a 14-hour flight between uh, Ecuador and the Netherlands. So how that typically pans out is that I spent the fall and some spring semester in Ecuador, and then I spent my summers in the Netherlands. And everything that's going on at the time with my research in the Netherlands and my doctoral candidates that I supervise in the Netherlands, we meet virtually. So we do try to meet once a week or once every other week, depending on how close the supervision relationship is, to keep in touch to not just meet when I am there, but that's kind of the way this uh, practically works out for me. Yeah. And then aside from a lot of the research and then um, your advisees, um, you're also teaching. So what kind of uh, courses are, are you teaching? At the moment, I teach one undergraduate course per semester at Universidad San Francisco de Quito. And I teach one Master of Engineering level course here in Ecuador as well, which typically means it's once per cohort. So it's once every two years, roughly. And then I'm now involved as well with new courses that we are developing for the new Master of uh, Structural Engineering program in the Netherlands. So there I will be involved with teaching in the fourth quarter, so towards the summer period, and then the fifth quarter of the master's program, which is right after the summer period. Most of my teaching in the Netherlands will be done virtually, so I'll be recording videos, providing content, and I teach those courses together with my other colleagues there. So they will be in the classroom. I will be delivering content online. Whereas my teaching here in Ecuador is typically in classroom, but of course, due to the pandemic that has changed. And actually, tomorrow will be my first day back in person since uh, March 2020. So I'm, wow. uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I still know how to use the projector. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> How and to think like it's been so long, you know, in this case, since you've actually been mm -hmm. in person, you know, uh, teaching. So, yeah, I mean, it, as much as it's a joke, it's also, you know, serious. Like, yeah, do I remember how to use <laughs> these devices and, you know, being able to, you know, teach in person again? Mm -hmm. um, what mm -hmm. Is it is it uh, like how are you feeling right now? Is it a lot of excitement? Yeah, I'm. I'm super excited to see my yeah. students back. It's. It's not the same uh, teaching online. Like, I've learned a lot from it. I've uh, seen it as, of course, it was very difficult um, for the students, for us to, to change. But I think I've learned a lot from the experience. But I'm very happy that I can be back in the classroom with my students, that I can feel the atmosphere of the class, that I can see their faces. And uh, those are things that I have missed a lot during the pandemic. And speaking of the pandemic, I know when we were uh, chatting a couple of months ago, when we were talking about the podcast, you know, we talked about the pandemic um, and there was a moment where you also said that in a way you were also saying yes to everything. Um, and, you know, so since then, ha has there been, you know, any lessons learned with that and uh, setting boundaries? Yes, it's been it's been quite a journey as well in learning, because when I was working from home, I thought I could take a 6 a.m. call with my colleagues in the Netherlands. And then at the time, I was also teaching in the master's program of Universidad San Francisco de Quito, which is geared towards people who work. So the master's program is at night or on weekends. So there were days that I was taking a 6 a.m. research meeting and then teaching from 5.45 to 9.30 p.m. And after a while of that, I thought, okay, this is just, not sustainable for me and I can't be showing up as my best self for my students so I I need to start setting clearer boundaries and I think with returning to my office that already set boundaries for example with research meetings that I said well the earliest I can be in my office here in Ecuador is 7 a.m because I have the earliest child care that I can arrange is 6 45 a.m and don't book me in for something at six. I, I won't be able to make it. I could take the call from home, but I try not to. Well, I'm not doing that. I just say I'll take it from my office at seven, but not earlier. And, you know, let's talk about advising from a distance. You know, um, mm -hmm. you, know you live in Ecuador, but you advise PhD students, you know, Netherlands, Denmark, Colombia, Brazil. 
Um, how is it working around like the various time zones? Um, you know, we're just now talking about taking, you know, a 6 a.m. research uh, meeting, mm-hmm. a call, and then teaching later in the afternoon, evening time. Um, how's, how do you work through, you know, advising students from all over the world? Yeah, so certainly my advisees are top priority for me. And I, at, before the start of every semester, I have a good look at what my week will my weeks will look like in terms of teaching hours. And with that, I schedule in a weekly meeting with the PhD students of whom I am their daily supervisor, and maybe a um, meeting every other week with the PhD students of whom I'm a secondary advisor or have a not a direct uh, advising relationship. And that makes sure that the time is reserved for them and it's booked in and we meet uh, either weekly or bi-weekly. And of course, also these meetings, these virtual meetings has been something we had to get used to. Um, So while initially, I think we mostly looked at it as progress meeting with the candidates just showing their progress, we have moved towards having a more set structure to the advice meetings where we start with an agenda of what we need to get through and we get to the topics. And then we also make some agreements for the coming week. And I think that part of really talking, okay, what are we going to work on next week? What's the planning? How do we stay on track is something that has helped the their research move forward, even though I'm at distance, but there's of course things that are more difficult, especially when there's laboratory work and something isn't working in the lab. I can't just, walk down from my office to the laboratory, which is what I do when I'm in the Netherlands. I can see the lab from from my office and I can just walk down one flight of stairs and go see, okay, what's not working here? Why is the sensor not working? And that's also a reason why we advise mostly in teams. So I mentioned that for some of the PhD candidates, I'm daily supervisor, co-supervisor. So we all supervise in teams where there's always somebody there who can help out when necessary. And the other thing that I've learned from supervising a distance is that it's sometimes harder to really feel how a student is doing and that it's harder to, to capture if, if something is not going well. Um, and now this summer, I had the chance to go back to the Netherlands and spend some good time with my, with my advisees and meet in person and talk through a lot of more big level thinking, planning, et cetera, for the remaining years of their PhD. And I think that was necessary as well. Yeah. Now with uh, kind of supervising, having a team with, is, is that pretty common uh, for like uh, grad students or um, the students that, that you work with? Yes. So the structure in the Netherlands, both for masters and PhD students is that they're typically supervised by a team. For the master students, it's a full committee and there's a chair of the committee, daily supervisor, and that's always the case. And for PhD students, they have at least two supervisors. They will always have a daily supervisor and their promoter who has to be a full professor. And in many cases, they also have assigned a mentor with whom they can talk more about the general progress of their PhD. So it's very common for them to have at least two people supervising them. They, they always have someone they can connect with. Mm-hmm. You know, we were talking to a couple of months ago, of like, you know, uh, you draw a lot to like from your experience as, as a PhD student, a prior PhD student. And also kind of we were talking about how things have changed, like for PhD candidates over, mm-hmm. let's say, the last 10 years. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, certainly. So when I was a PhD candidate, there was no structure to the PhD itself in the Netherlands. And some people made a joke that it was just a mushroom method where you put PhD students in a dark room for four years and and throw something on them every now and then. And after four years, you open the door and see if they are ready to harvest. (laughs) And by now, of course, that has improved a lot. There, um, There were a lot of issues with people not being able to graduate on time, not getting the support they needed. And now we have a much stronger structure to the PhD program. It's still very research focused in the Netherlands. So they they do take some courses, but the component of coursework is much less than in, for example, in 
typical PhD program in the United States. So now they do have to pass a formal, what we call a go-no-go meeting after the first year, where they have to present their plan, pretty much like a proposal to a committee, which also has external people involved, to see if it's feasible to do the research within the four years. They have certain courses that they need to take and the courses are some only some of these courses are really related to their field of research the other two-thirds of the courses that they should be taking is really related to their transferable skills learning to write learning to present and then they also have um, skills related to for example making poster presentations, things like that. So that's actually the larger component of the structure of the PhD program. It also requires them to take some onboarding courses in the beginning to get them familiar with the university, the regulations and all that. So it makes everything more streamlined. And, you know, just generally speaking, like for someone that is considering maybe applying, um, you know, for a PhD, any advice for for individuals that are considering a PhD program or a certain university or getting involved in research? Mm -hmm. I would say the first thing to do is to really understand the differences between PhD programs and how to apply for them. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of emails of people applying for a PhD position at our university in the Netherlands, but that's not how the process works. We only hire when we have a funded position and then we advertise it like a job. So we really consider in the Netherlands the PhD candidates as employees of the university. So they get hired like a regular hiring process. And we cannot just start somebody in fall or spring. It, that's not how it works. It's when we have an opening. So I would say if you are considering different universities, really make sure that you know how it works, how the system is structured, if, it, if you're interested more in learning courses and learning with various professors, you may want to go to a PhD program that has more of an educational component to it. Whereas if you say, no, I really want to spend a lot of time in the laboratory, then maybe a research focused uh, PhD program is much more what you're looking for. And based on that, really to, to see what the options are out there and then apply to a program that, that suits your needs. Yeah, absolutely. Great advice. And so I was listening to a, a, an interview um, that you were on and you were asked about skills that are good for PhD uh, students. And you had mentioned that um, in, in your uh, uh, personal view, you had uh, taken a course uh, during like your second master's program and that course is on uh, writing and presenting. And then you credit that course as, you know, to kind of to the success in, in your career. Uh, what was it specifically about that course? First, I thought if I take just like a writing course, English course is going to be easy credits. Uh, and it actually turned out quite a struggle because we learned how to write an abstract. We learned how to present, but also we used uh, the books of Edward Tufte on how to present information visually. And those were all things I had never really thought about. So it was a big wake up call for me to say, to learn like, oh, there are actually rules or good practices to present and to write and to write an abstract. And of course it took me some effort to learn those skills, but I think those were absolutely key in me being able to write better reports and abstracts and papers in, in the years of my PhD. And in another interview you had mentioned, um, how doing study abroad, you know, made you more resilient um, and able to kind of see different perspectives. Uh, can you talk more about your study abroad experience? Yes. Yeah, so my first study abroad experience was during my second master's it was in the United States. And after that, I moved to the Netherlands. And then after my PG, I moved to Ecuador. So I would say I have gone through the process of adapting to a new country various times by now and I also have gone through the roller coaster of what is a culture shock and adjusting to a new place every time so I I can say that yes that is going to be something that happens when you move abroad you're going to at some point find everything fantastic and at some point find everything awful and at some point you reach a balance and you will uh, learn from the experience and be grateful that you've had uh, that experience 
And certainly when it comes to engineering education, there is a very different approach between Belgium, United States and the Netherlands. So Belgium is very much focused on the mathematical aspects of engineering. Everything starts from a very solid basis of mathematics. And I remember that for the Belgian educational system, a course on continuum mechanics is sort of the foundation. Whereas when I went to the United States, I learned that that's like an elective for PhD students because it's so mathematical. So the the way the structure of the program is from in the, in Belgium from the foundation of the sciences all the way to what is comes in our last years of learning to actually design a concrete element is very much different from how it's in the United States where you learn first how to design and you learn the practical skills and then maybe if you get really into the weeds during a PhD you may want to look at really the mathematical formulations behind it. So seeing that at first I was very disoriented and trying to make sense of how things were thought. But I, I think that that change in thinking really helped me later in my career as a researcher and also as a professor. Uh, where did like the research interests come from? Like from very young age? Uh, how did that come about? I've always wanted to be, so when I was a child, I wanted to be either an astronaut or an inventor. So I think there was already some interest, certainly in the sciences there and in figuring things out. And as I was doing my first, my studies in Brussels, I started to see that I'm really interested in reading a lot, understanding problems, and then trying to do something new with that. And during my second master's, it became very clear to me that I would want to go do a PhD. I wasn't quite sure if that would mean doing the PhD and after that go to industry and build bridges, because at that time I was still thinking, well, I maybe want to see something built. Um, but that, during that time, I really learned that I enjoy being in the lab. I enjoy playing around with the data and trying to solve puzzles in my research. Because you have so many different, you know, you have your research interests, you know, you, um, you know, a lot of job responsibilities. But one of the things, too, that uh, you found an interest in uh I think was when your daughter was born and, you know, it was kind of led you to explore a little bit more, even write about balance or combination between academic, like career and also parenting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it came both from very practical aspects as I was working at two universities and trying to travel, but I was still with uh, a recently born baby. So I, um, who was nursing at the time. So one of the sort of things that I ran into and that called my attention is that very few conferences or none of the conferences in my field had any facilities for nursing mothers, nor my university in the Netherlands at the time had any facilities in the building. So those are the things that I took to the conference organizers and my supervisors to say, hey, uh, I cannot be the only mom in engineering here. So maybe it's time for you to think about those things. And that did make some changes with, within the building where there is now a, a nursing facility and in some conferences as well where they said, oh, we never even thought of that. And that led me to explore this whole aspect of what does it mean to be a parent in academia and then certainly with the pandemic on top of that, and I had the chance to work with some colleagues on research, really looking at what is the impact of COVID-19 on academic parents. And sometimes, yeah, it, it's something where you, like you're talking about like the conference organizers, it was something they didn't even think about, but mm -hmm. it takes someone to bring it up to say, hey, maybe it's something you should think about. And then now an action happened and now it's, it's taken care of. Yes, yes. Uh, and on top of a lot of the other things that you do, uh, you also uh, co-host a podcast called mm -hmm. PhD Talk. Uh, talk to us more about this podcast. How, how, how did that, turn, that idea turn into reality? Yeah, so I've always very much enjoyed listening to podcasts. And I had the idea of starting a podcast already a long time. I think the first time that I thought of it must have been 2013. But then the idea of starting it and figuring out the audio and all of that just it seemed to be too much. But then during the pandemic, um, of course, we all didn't know what to do on top of teaching virtually and that. I thought, well, maybe 
maybe I want to do something fun on top of everything else. And let me look for a co-host. And we kind of divide and conquer the responsibilities of the podcast and the hosting and writing the show notes and everything that comes with it. So that's how the podcast started. And the idea was as well to have a co-host who is a current PhD student and to have conversations on what it's like to do the PhD, what are some of the, the things you've learned, what are some of the practical things that you're working on at the moment. And we do um, episodes around that, as well as interviews with current PhD students and those who work with them. And the first season of the podcast, I, uh, my co-host was Rico, and he was then uh, finalizing his PhD. So I found a new co-host for the second uh, season, which is uh, currently running. And my co-host now is Sarah. Yeah, and and I think now you're in in like the seventies uh, for for the episode, so yes. it it is going. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes. For anyone that might be interested, um, do you have like a particular episode that you think could be a good like jumping on point, or do the topics vary to the point that anyone can kind of just listen to any episode? Yeah, I would say anyone can listen to any episode. We do have a structure of one. Uh, one episode between the two co-hosts and one episode that is an interview. And we title the episodes really, the interview would be the name of the interviewee. And then the uh, episodes with the two co-hosts really are related to one topic. For example, going to a conference, writing your first journal paper, responding to reviewer comments. So I think whatever you are currently working on or struggling with, we may have covered it already in one of the episodes. So you can look for the title and uh, have, have a listen. Yeah, and we'll include the the link uh, to your podcast in the show notes for us. And yeah, yeah, anyone's listening that's like, uh, that actually sounds fascinating. Let me go and take a look. Because yeah, there could be a question that someone has, and you might already have a podcast episode that already addresses that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have, uh, if you don't find the episode related to that, do feel free to send us questions. As we do every 10th episode, we clear out our mail back of questions that come in and we do a Q&A episode. Wonderful. And as we wind down uh, in this interview, um, did I read correctly that you were also a former uh, music reviewer? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that. So I, I've always loved music and I play a lot of instruments. I used to play in a number of bands, um, Potentially one of the things that I miss most with the pandemic, the not being able to, to play with other musicians. And then actually people that I was playing in a small orchestra with, they moved to a different country during the pandemic. So I'm kind of without band or without uh, uh, ensemble at the moment. Um, but one of the things that I started doing during my PhD is to re review new cities. And I always love listening to new releases. One of the things that I used to do a lot during my PhD would to be to go to CD store on Saturdays and have a, a stack of new releases and start listening to them and see which ones to buy. And since I was spending a lot of money on that, I thought, well, I can volunteer to review new releases and get review copies in advance. And that's hey. kind of how it started. Yes. Hey, that's a great way to get, to get that music. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah, so you can find me on Facebook as PhD Talk, on Twitter at Eva Lanzocht, everything together, and on Instagram at Eva Lanzocht as well. Awesome. Eva, this is a fantastic interview. A lot of great uh, topics that we got to discuss today. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much for having me. Ava, thank you so much for joining me today and being a guest on the podcast. It was informative hearing about advising from a distance, working with PhD students, study abroad, and academic careers and parenting. And we have finished today's episode. Join us next time for episode 68. In the meantime, if you don't already, subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on social media at Advising Podcast. Take care and keep advising.